Are you ready for rapid fire? I am ready for the fire. So we didn't get to this one in the opening segment because you did have so much whiteboard today. Notre Dame's offensive line named to the Joe Moore Award midseason honor roll today. The Joe Moore Award Voting Committee judges solely on six criteria. Toughness, effort, teamwork, consistency, technique, and finishing. So what do you think? Joe Moore honor roll, midseason honor roll for Notre Dame's offensive line. Yeah, I think that Notre Dame uh, definitely is one de deserving to be on this uh, midseason honor roll. I think that they have one of the better offensive line units in the country, obviously. Um, but you would, I guess the number one thing that you would look at is the game that they let their team down the most was ultimately the game that that they lost, you know, and I, that I'm specifically think, talking about Louisville because I thought the offensive line was great against Ohio state. They got a lot of push. They did what they needed to. Um, but ultimately you could put, you know, at least 25, 30% of the blame in the Louisville game on the Notre Dame offensive line. And we know they weren't healthy. We know there were guys rotating in and out a lot, but I mean, even like guys like Joe Alt flat up missed blocks. Right. And so um, it, it was just a bad day. Overall, and I think out of the eight games, that is their only mulligan so far, and they've played really, really well um, the rest of the season. Do you did you happen to see um, who else uh, is on the midseason honor roll? I don't know why you're asking me this question. <laughs> I know Tennessee is on there. I'm trying to think. There were a bunch of tweets that I saw. Um, let me see if I can find. I know Duke is on there. Clemson yeah, is on there. Michigan is on there. Um, yep. I'm trying to think. Overall, there's six, eight, nine, ten. So here's 13, 18. Air Force, which just joined the top 25 this week. Clemson, Duke, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Kansas State, Kentucky, Louisville, LSU, Miami, Michigan, Missouri. Notre Dame, Ohio State, Oregon are some of them who are on there. Texas is on there. Central Florida is on there. Washington and Wyoming also on there, as is Oregon State and Penn State. So some pretty notable ones. Pretty yeah, notable. I think the most interesting – I guess the reason why I was asking you that was setting up my next point. Um, Clemson <laughs> being on there is a little worrisome for me because that's going to be a tough road environment atmosphere. And if Notre Dame's offense is going to keep being stagnant, like they have been of the last three, four games, I just think that that Clemson game is going to be a lot more uncomfortable than what people probably want. If, if they can't figure it out offensively, it, it, yeah. remind, it would remind me of another stalemate kind of Duke matchup. I think at the end of the day. Yeah, Exactly. Stymie says Colorado question mark question mark question mark mm. jokes yes good jokes it, you know they've been they've been solid we obviously haven't been able to watch all of these other teams game in and game out to see how they perform and how some of the other lines perform I guess I was a little bit surprised to see him and it's probably maybe a little bit of recency bias because of what happened against Louisville you know like you mentioned the fact that they only ran the ball for 44 yards on 28 carries against Louisville and really even against Duke you take out the Audric Estime touchdown run at the end and it's 31 carries for 146 yards you know so that's that's not a lot even against USC 125 yards on 29 carries so they definitely played better against USC than they played against Louisville but at the same time I think they should have played even better than that. Now, they have only allowed 11 sacks this year, and it's interesting that nine of those 11 sacks came in two games combined, Louisville and North Carolina State, one of the better defenses that they've seen this year in NC State, one against a defense that really had no business <laughs> dominating the way they have. So, like again, when you look at those criteria that I talked about, toughness, effort, teamwork, consistency, technique, finishing i think the consistency and the technique a little bit you know room for improvement here down the stretch and you're absolutely right about that clemson game some things need to be addressed i think getting into that clemson game they showed signs of 
of getting things going again this last week against USC. Need to keep seeing some improvement going forward. Now, I'm going to throw one at you here that I didn't have on the list because it came in late this afternoon. Saturday's Notre Dame-USC game had an average of 6.8 million viewers. According to NBC, it's the most watched Irish home game against their rival, like Notre Dame-USC game, since the 2005 Bush-Push game. All four Notre Dame primetime games in this last month have drawn an average of at least 5 million viewers. What do you think about that? I think that obviously that's great overall. And it speaks to, you know, the brand of Notre Dame. And it speaks to, you know, just the high level games that Notre Dame is going to play um, year in and year out. And when you bring a USC to Notre Dame Stadium, they're undefeated. They're a top 10 opponent. You know, Notre Dame's coming off uh, uh, the back end of a really tough stretch. Uh, I just think it's... uh, again, just shows how much viewership uh, Notre Dame is able to draw in. And I think that it's something that's ultimately always going to continue. Um, And the reason why Notre Dame is always going to have the strong arm on NBC and any of these contract negotiations. And as a couple of guys, Stymie and Josh are, are chiming in about the value in the TV contract. It's absolutely right. And you throw in, the fact that USC is moving to the Big Ten next year and what, you know, it's no surprise. Notre Dame versus Ohio State, Notre Dame versus USC, the two most viewed games of the season in terms of the Fighting Irish and, you know, for the NBC contract, because what, I mean, you've got Tennessee State, I guess Navy was on NBC, you know, and that drew a, excuse me, a decent rating as well. And of course, Central Michigan was on Peacock, but I think it's only going to be good and... I, I think that it's from the Notre Dame NBC perspective, especially if USC can 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 stay where they are right now and continue to be at least a top 25 program year in and year out and Notre Dame stays in that echelon, that's going to be really good for for NBC and it, it it's going to be really good for Notre Dame as well because you've got that built-in Notre Dame USC, Notre Dame Big Ten matchup that NBC is going to be able to televise both home and away. So that's going to be good for everybody. And I think it's just it's just, you know, more ammunition for Notre Dame going forward. The the, the fact that when you get these marquee kind of games, it's you know, people people are going to watch them. Now, the downside is you don't have much of a home schedule next year in terms of marquee opponents. It's going to be a little bit down next year but uh you you know you keep kind of getting some of those marquee games on there and it's going to be nothing but good news for notre dame in terms of of the uh the tv contract negotiation going forward so marcus freeman was asked after the win over usc about bouncing back they did it twice last year and here's what freeman had to say about bouncing back weeks that you lose are are really long especially around here you know, the expectation that you win every game you play. And I know this, the hours are the same, but the weeks that you win, they seem to go by really fast, you know, and the next opportunity is here. But it is what it is. You know what I mean? And, and you have to pick your head up and go back to work. Adversity is a part of life. I told our guys, here's the word I use. I said, I want to be an anti-fragile program. I told them this on Monday. We have to be an anti-fragile program. What does that mean? We just didn't get through it. We didn't get through adversity. We are better because of the adversity that we face. That's easy to say. The challenge is do the things that it takes to make sure we're better, and that's what these guys, these coaches and players did. Some new messaging there for Marcus Freeman. Anti-fragile program. So what do you think about that new messaging for Marcus Freeman about being an anti-fragile program? Yeah, and – First of all, I I love that messaging. And like you said, it was something new uh, of like those kind of add it to maybe one of the the, the list of cliches that that Marcus uh, has has kind of put out there since being head coach at Notre Dame. But I I like the mindset of being anti-fragile because that means you can't allow things to break you. Fragile things means that you're easily breakable. Right. And so Notre Dame can't be easily breakable. And ultimately what he's getting at. Is they have to be resilient, right? Like while the the sting 
of losses can affect you. You can't be fragile and allow it to break you. You have to learn from it and allow it, uh, allow it to, to teach you something and ultimately get better from it. And I think that's, that's the mark of a great head coach, in my opinion, because you're going to suffer tough losses. Not everything is going to go your way every point of the season, right? And so you have to be anti-fragile in those moments. You have to allow yourself not to break, just to bend, and then you come back stronger from it. You learn from it, and then you're able to fix those mistakes going forward. And I'm just amazed at how many different ways Marcus Freeman can sort of weave his message after, you know, that there's just these different iterations that we've had after some of these speed bumps and, you know, bumps in the road that have come along the way. And you're absolutely right. You've got to find a way to be resilient and bounce back. And because there is, especially at at the point they were at going into USC between the fact you were playing your biggest rival. And at that point, there were still five games to go in the regular season plus no bowl game, well, I guess, yeah, no, well, no, no bowl game guaranteed yet at that point. There is now they won six games, but there's a lot still to play for. And you can't just let the thing fall apart because you had a couple of tough breaks in a three week span. And, you know, I, I, I am pretty amazed that again, that, that he kind of keeps finding ways, not only to weave that message and deliver that message, but then listening to some of the players afterwards, whether it was Sam Hartman or Andre Estime or J.D. Bertrand, you know, Jadarian Price, whoever, some of the guys who came, you know, who stood up there after the game as well. The fact that that they continue to be bought into this thing, you know, so I think it's uh, I think it's pretty amazing the way that uh, he's been able to do that. And I'm with Stymie, Fragile. You know, I Big, live about uh, two miles from price. that house. The Christmas Story house. Have you guys ever been? Did you go there like last year around Christmas time or anything? Um, it is a you can do a tour. Um, there's a really good restaurant across the street, actually, that was um, on Guy Fieri's diners, dive ins and drives. And so I ate there and then obviously saw it was across the street. But they actually just sold the house, to be honest with you. It went up for oh, really? actual sale and someone bought it. Interesting. OK. Fill in the blank, Jess. It's blank that after Saturday's win over USC, Notre Dame has now gone 21 straight games without a wide receiver having a 100-yard game. (laughs) It's mind-blowing to me and also shows um, the the lack of explosiveness from the wide receiver room uh, at the end of the same – at the same time to me. But – it's still impressive that Notre Dame finds a way to move the ball downfield in the passing game, um, even if they don't have a a thousand yard wide receiver. Right. And so last year it was just focusing mainly on Michael Mayer, who was your best pass catcher. Um, And then this year it's just kind of distributing the ball to whoever's, you know, there. And honestly, whoever's been healthy the last kind of, you know, three or four games. So um, I, I think that this problem is actually going to take care of itself relatively soon. Um, assuming, you know, what Notre Dame's, I, I don't know what they're going to do at quarterback, um, but they have a lot of young, talented wide receivers who are just now getting started. And I have more confidence in these guys going forward than I have of maybe some of these wide receiver rooms in the past. It is amazing because we are coming up on two full calendar years, two full seasons since they had a 100 yard receiver the last time there have been three there have been in in 2021 here are the last three do you want to take a guess you want to take a guess at who the receivers are notre dame's last three receivers to have 100 yard games i bet if i give you three guesses you wouldn't get one of them you don't think so give it a shot um let's see i'm quickly trying to go through don't cheat don't cheat i see you looking at your computer don't cheat (laughs) i'm looking at a roster that's all i'm looking at my first guess was avery davis yes you actually got it on the first guess he was one of them 
Uh, my second guess. You're cheating, though. You're, you're, you're. I'm just you're looking, looking at, at a roster. roster. Yeah, but still, that's all you've got to do. It's like you look at the roster and you you can tell which <laughs> receivers did it. I'll tell you this: Lorenzo Styles was the last one to do it. How I, you know, the irony of that: Lorenzo Styles, who is now a reserve cornerback at Ohio State, was Notre Dame's last wide receiver to have a hundred yard game, 136 in the Fiesta Bowl against Oklahoma State. He was the last one to do it. Avery Davis was one of the three to do it that same season in 2021. He did it against Purdue. There was one other wide receiver who had two 100-yard games that year. Kevin Come on. Austin? You, yeah, I was going to say, you've looked at the roster. I know you had to know it at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at a roster. It's not like I'm looking at box scores. Jeez. Yeah, but there are only so many receivers who were even playing that year. Come on. It's my memory of who was wide receiver in 2021. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, look, the tight ends are doing it. Michael Mayer obviously had several. Mitchell Evans and Holden Stays each have one this year. They just haven't been able to kind of put this thing together in the way things were operating early on. You didn't need it. Sam Hartman was spreading the ball around and everyone was kind of sharing the wealth, but between injuries, the emergence of both tight ends, and, you know, like Jordan Faison coming around. And, like, Chris Tyree only gets, you know, like two or three catches a game, and he he just doesn't get enough quantity to push it up there. But his yards per catch is up there over 20 yards, I, I think, still at this point. So I think it's kind of a matter of time because, like, you know, even, like, think back to the – the Central Michigan game. You had two receivers in that game have 70 plus yard touchdown catches and they still didn't go over 100 <laughs> yards in the game. Just it's just nuts the way things have worked out. It was fun looking at that 2020 2021 roster because Xavier Watts was still a wide receiver at that point. He was. That's right. Good point. Good point. Fill in the blank. Irish punter Bryce McPherson running down USC punt returner Zachariah Zachariah Branch Saturday night was blank. It was extreme athleticism from unathletic punters. And (laughs) all I could think of during that play was, well, first of all, I thought he was going to score once he broke the edge. Uh And then I just saw the punter come flying out of nowhere. And I was like, who is this? And then once I realized that it was a skinny white guy chasing down, you know, branch along the sideline, I was like, that's the punter. And all I could think to myself is this guy's got tremendous speed for being a punter. He's, he's catching one of the fastest guys in the field at full stride. And so, you know, one, he had to take a good angle, but even with a good angle, you got to have exceptional speed to catch up with someone like Zachariah branch. So again, I was shocked by the athleticism from, a position group that is rather known for their unathleticism. I mean, it is, you know, punters are, as you said, not known for their athleticism. Bryce McPherson's got quite an athletic background, though. He was a really good high school athlete. He was a two-time state wrestling champion in North Carolina, for starters, which isn't going to make you fast, but, you know. Still athletic. Yeah, athletic and, you know, good athlete, you know, to be a state, you know, two-time state wrestling champion champion he was also a high school defensive end not just a punter you don't see that very often like guys who end up punting at at a power five program being a high school defensive end but he ran track as well he was he's a his high school record holder in the long jump and the triple jump and was on a couple relay teams as well so he really like he surprised me seeing him because branch is also a guy with legit speed he ran an official 10.33 in the hundred In high school, Zachariah Branch did. And to see Bryce McPherson run him down, he was moving. And there were some people who thought that um, that was uh, Braylon James out there because they both wear 14, of course. But, but of course, as we all know, you can't have duplicate numbers, you know, out there (laughs) on the special teams. But it was actually Bryce McPherson hauling him down. It was something, man. I mean, that he really showed me something that he was able to make a play like that. So that was, that was I, that I was guarantee really 95% of punters in the country aren't making that play. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And some people said that Pat McAfee needs the clip. Well, Pat McAfee's got a host of producers. If they want the clip, they can find the clip. Or you guys can just cut it and send it to him. You know, he'd love it, I'm sure. 
because he's been on a that's proprietary information. He's been on a Notre Dame love fest here, you know, since uh, since he was the only one to pick Notre Dame against USC. So, Uh, Tommy's Tommy's giving you a hard time now. Know the roster better, he says, shaming you. (laughs) Oh, I got uh, I got to throw out a little a a little stray here, but um, our boss Brian sent me uh, access to the boards. I was able to get access full access to the boards now. Nice. Uh, and so I, Very I, I nice. was I was scrolling through and reading some stuff, and I found a little appreciation post. And <laughs> that's not what I'm bringing this up for. I'm bringing it up, up because there was one comment in there by none none only than DK uh, giving criticism of my boutique hats and not wearing <laughs> IB apparel. And and what do you know? I get an email from Brian last night saying I need to wear more of our IB apparel. So. For all the people out there who want to criticize the hats, I uh, brought out a fresh new IB hat today. All right. All right. I was wondering why you had the IB hat on and not your boutique hat like you were talking about there. So (laughs) I had to take my hat off. It was starting to itch my head. So that's why I took mine off here in the middle. But I'm glad that you're on the boards now because, you know, I was uh, every once in a while, I'll pass something along that I see to you. So I'm glad that you actually have access for the board. Yes. And news. I appreciate the little emails that you send out. You can take, you can take part in the boards as well. So NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell is considering playing a super bowl in London. Do you buy or sell the super bowl overseas? This is a hundred percent sell for me. Uh, this is, you know, the NFL, the national football league. It is obviously an American based league. Um, and I think the last thing you want to do to fans is take the Super Bowl away. Um, and, and I know fans would still watch, but uh, I don't think that you would get, a, 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 you know, essentially a kind of a fair attendance from some of these teams. Like imagine your team makes the Super Bowl and it hasn't made the Super Bowl in X amount of years. And then Goodell just randomly decides, hey, we're going to put this Super Bowl over in London. Right. Like maybe you wanted to go because your team was there. Maybe, you know, this or that. And now you have all these added variables by potentially adding a Super Bowl overseas. I just, I, there is literally no benefit uh, in this for me. And I think that he'll get a lot of backlash for it ultimately. Those were my initial thoughts as well. But then here's the other side of it, I think. The Super Bowl is not for the average fan. The Super Bowl is <laughs> it's predominantly for the elite, kind of. <laughs> it, it is. It really is. It's for the elite. It is all these corporate sponsors. Like I know someone whose dad, works for a company who always gets Super Bowl tickets. So he's been to a million, but again, it's like he gets tickets through the company. They're the, you know, like corporate sponsor type deal. It's cool, and that, but they're not invo- emotionally invested in the game. That's exactly right. It's celebrities and it's corporate sponsorship people who probably make up 80% of the, you know, attendance at a Super Bowl. So really it's like, what difference does it make where it's played? It's, <laughs> it's in a stadium. It's on TV. Now you're right. Like if your team happens to go and you're thinking, well, I don't care what it's going to cost. I'm going to shell out some money and get me the tickets and I'm going to go. Or at least be there. Right. Like some people will just go hang out around the area, maybe tailgate. It is a lot harder when you're talking about London, as opposed to obviously anywhere in the continental United States, but Roger Goodell, you know, they played all these games in London for however many years it is now. They, they played games in Munich, Last year, they're going to keep playing there overseas. They want that European market. They want it to be a global sport. So they're going to do it. And again, like I agree for the most part with what you're saying. I don't want to see the Super Bowl go over overseas, but because of the fact that it is so corporate and it is like so cost prohibitive for the average fan to actually attend these games, it's like, what difference does it make? I'm, I'm probably just going to watch every Super Bowl for the rest of my life on TV anyway. So. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and for that matter, you know, they play in those soccer stadiums over there in Europe. So, they, you know, they probably even bigger attendance because those soccer stadiums are so big. Last one. Fill in the blank. It's blank. The Olympics has officially added flag football as a sport for the 2028 <laughs> L.A. Olympics. It's fun that they've added flag football as one of the Olympic sports. And it's funny that you bring this up. Because my girlfriend actually brought this up to me and she was like, did you know that they're adding flag football to the Olympics? And I said, no, I didn't know that. But who would be I I guess the biggest takeaway I had from it is 
who could the Olympics recruit or, you know, maybe the, the team USA recruit in order to play for them? Is this more of like NFL guys who are showing up for a seven on seven or are they actually recruiting specific flag football studs? Like, cause there's gotta be like pro-ams and you know how like there's slow pitch softball tournaments around the, right. the country. There's gotta right. be flag football, uh, I guess, gurus or professionals that play across the country. So are you looking at more of that guys who are in tune to, you know, actual flag football or you bring in over some of your top NFL talent and just telling them to basically play seven on seven. But I guess my takeaway from it is you have to win because if you're the United States of America, like that's that football is the football United is States your sport, whether it's flag football or not. That's right. right. And so I think that's where you have to tread that line lightly of, are we, are we, are we doing this thing with the NFL players or are we doing this thing, you know, with the professional flag football players? And I think, this is kind of often what you see the NBA run into is sometimes they, you know, they don't run their best squads out there. Um, and then, you know, something happens, a slip up and you know, the United States is like, Oh, well you know, now we're going to bring our best players. You know, Kevin Durant's going to play LeBron James is going to play, you know, X, Y, Z is going to play. And it's like, okay, well, why didn't you just do that in the beginning? It wasn't enticing enough. So I think when you it, introduce flag football as a new sport and you're talking about football, I think a lot of these NFL guys are naturally going to want to do it because they'd like to be an Olympic athlete. They'd like to be, you know, a world-class gold medal athlete. So I would love to see the NFL guys come over and have Tyreek Hill out there, have Jamar Chase out there, have Patrick Mahomes throwing him the ball. Like, I think it would be sweet if the NFL guys decide to do it. I mean, it would, it would, it would be a, a huge advantage, obviously, for the United States if they did. <laughs> since nobody, you know, since there's very little football around the world but you know like i see people you know knocking it and they're obviously not going to have full contact football in the olympics because you know for one you can only play one game per week and two again you know like you need much bigger people and the whole thing these two topics really kind of go hand in hand because the nfl was pushing for this getting flag football in the olympics and again you know the piggybacking on the topic about a Super Bowl possibly being in London. Roger Goodell and the NFL want more globalization of their sport. They want to be able to sell the NFL around the world. And so that's that's part of this push, using flag football in the Olympics to get more people, you know, because because again, you're not going to have high level tackle football in all these countries right off the bat. They just want more people playing football and being interested in football and they want to spurn more interest around the world. I think if you know that what you were talking about and you went a lot of different ways with your answer, but <laughs> you're absolutely right. Like how does the U S approach it? You know, do they, do they go with like former college or NFL players like you're talking about as the guys playing, or do you go with like some of these advanced, whatever league, or do you want me to put this in here? Like I just saw you, bring something up backstage <laughs> yeah. do you go with like advanced actual flag football type teams and you know like do you put together all-star teams or do you you know have a team that kind of advances its way through qualification and that kind of thing to get to the olympics now what is the, oh this is your your flag football field is that what this is yeah so i just i, I started googling around they have it's 70 it's 70 yards from back of end zone to back of end zone 10 yard end zone. So really it's 60 yard or sorry, 50 yards, you know, front of pylon to front of pylon. Um, and then you have these like no rush zones. You have areas on the field where you can't run the ball. I don't know. I just, I don't know enough about flag football. So I thought it was a cool graphic to kind of bring up yeah. of what's now, going on. Yeah. Like the last time I played any flag football was in the army. So, you know, and that's been a while and we didn't have like zones where you can't rush and stuff like that. I'm sure in the, you know, in like this higher level stuff, you've got a lot of more complicated rules probably than what we had. But by the way, baseball and softball along with flag football have been readmitted nice. as Olympic sports. Both of those were Olympic sports for a while. They took them away. Like the United States dominated in, in softball for so long. I think that was part of why they ended up taking it away. Um, but they're bringing it back. So baseball and softball and flag football will all, uh, will uh, all be in the Olympics in 2028. Nice. Maybe, Excited maybe for baseball you, and softball to be Maybe back. you should gear yourself up. Put you, you know, you're in the right age demographic. Get yourself in, you know, like get ready to go. 
put together your flag football team, go be an Olympian. I'll be an Olympic coach. How okay. about that? <laughs> All right. I'm not moving well enough in space these days yeah, to be playing I hear you. flag football. Yeah. That's a lot of that's going around. A lot of people in the same boat. <laughs> All right, Jesse, great whiteboard stuff as always on this Tuesday during the bye week. Appreciate it. And um, we'll be back, of course, tomorrow. Vince will be rolling in tomorrow. I haven't seen Vince in a while. I don't even remember. I guess we did countdown all three of us together last week. I don't remember other than that the last show that I did with Vince. So He's Vince, back for the first time on a Wednesday in like I two know. or three weeks. I know. It's been uh, me and Sean Davis last couple weeks on Wednesday. So Vince will be back tomorrow, and we will have more Notre Dame football conversation for you jesse i will talk to you later everyone else hit that like button and of course subscribe rate and review and we'll talk to you tomorrow on ib nation sports talk